Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Today, we are going over procedural sedation, formerly known as conscious sedation. So, what is it and when is it used? Procedural sedation is essentially giving a patient sedative and at times opioid medications in order to sedate them so that a diagnostic or therapeutic procedure can be done. The goal is to sedate the patient without causing an alteration in their cardiorespiratory status. However, we know that every patient reacts differently towards medications, and although we do our best to provide just enough, at times complications do arise. Of course, we will go over these complications, how to prevent them, what to do if they do come up, we'll go over the common medications used, and we'll do our best to hit all of the important topics. Commonly in the ER, we'll use procedural sedation with orthopedic procedures like reductions, since they can be extremely painful. We can also see with lumbar punctures, when performing a TEE, or even with, a, with cardioverting a patient. As discussed, procedural sedation can be used to perform a diagnostic or therapeutic intervention. Now let's go into how do we prepare for a procedural sedation. First, let's talk about the staff. Who should be involved? Ideally, you want a respiratory therapist to help monitor the patient's airway and respiratory status and to help intervene in case complications do come up. You'll have the provider who is doing the actual procedure, and you should also have a second provider who is overseeing the medication administration and also monitoring the patient's cardiorespiratory status. Then there's you, the RN, who is in charge of charting and most importantly of continuously monitoring the patient. By monitoring the patient, I mean you are looking for chest rise, keeping a close eye on the SpO2 and end title, as well as the vital signs like the blood pressure and even the ECG rhythm on the monitor. Essentially, you are the person in charge of making sure the patient is still breathing and their airway reflexes are maintaining. Although we'll discuss it sh shortly, this is why when a procedural sedation is done, the ratio is one to one, meaning this patient is your only patient. You do not ever leave the bedside of the patient. You do not stop monitoring the patient until the patient is back to their normal baseline. Again, this is a one to one ratio. This is your only patient. Now, let's get into some of the important things that must be occurring before the procedural before the procedure actually starts. First and foremost, most informed consent must be obtained. The provider does this. They need to go over everything, including risks and answering any of the patient's questions that they may have. Next is doing a pre-procedure assessment and the provider's deciding what the ASA level is. So the this ASA level risk helps gauge the overall risk associated with the procedure. It goes from one through six, with one being a healthy patient, two, mild systemic disease, three is a severe systemic disease, and so forth. Now, with NPO status, you'll hear that a patient should be NPO from food for at least six hours and two hours from fluids, which is a good baseline as it keeps everything standardized. However, be aware that guidelines say that it is okay to perform the procedure without regard to the NPO status, especially if it is life or limb saving. However, it should always be decided on a patient by patient basis, keeping risks and possible complications in mind. For example, if a patient just had a really big meal and whatever procedure that needs to be done can wait a little, then it'd be safer to just wait to minimize any possible complications. You'll want to ensure that your patient is on the monitor connected to SpO2, heart rate rhythm, and blood pressure because it'll be part of your it'll be part of how you monitor the patient during the procedure. You're going to want to have good IV access, and you're going to want to have your patient on end tidal CO2. End tidal CO2 readings come very close to what the arterial CO2 is. So if your CO2 starts to rise very fast, it means your patient is possibly apneic and not breathing. It's another tool used to ensure we are monitoring our patients in the best way possible. In regards to IV fluids, providers may decide to have a bolus ongoing, especially when agents like propofol are used since they can decrease the blood pressure. Now, this is perhaps the most important. Ensure that from wherever you are standing, that you are able to see the patient, that you are able to clearly see if they're having chest rise and fall, because it's up to you to keep the patient safe. And with procedural sedation, the main issue you worry about, as discussed, is the patient's respiratory status being compromised. Of course, prepare for complications, which will be usually respiratory failure in nature. So we have an ambu bag ready, we have suction ready, we have airway equipment ready, and intubation equipment, and MPA, and so forth. You have the crash cart readily available just in case. Again, you have good IV access, so fluids and other medications can be given if needed.
Now, before the procedure actually starts, you do a timeout to ensure you have the correct patient, the correct procedure, and the correct site. Again, just remember that you are there to keep the patient safe. And you do this by preparing adequately, ensuring you can handle anything that may come up. So what is the most important thing we as the nurse need to be focused on? It's the patient's cardiorespiratory status, meaning are they ventilating and oxygenating adequately? And is perfusion steady? Is the BP holding? Key things include being able to see the patient, having the patient on the monitor, including SpO2 and end title, and having BVM, suction, and airway equipment readily available. All of these are simply to ensure you are monitoring the patient. You are looking for chest rise and fall, meaning the patient is taking good deep breaths. Is that If the end tidal CO2 starts to increase, you know the patient isn't ventilating appropriately. And if the SpO2 starts to drop, you know the patient is not oxygenating as they should be. So what if your patient goes apneic? What do you do then? You either, either you or another team member need to open the airway, meaning jaw thrust or head tilt and stimulating the patient to wake up and hence take a deep breath. This most of the time does the trick, but if it doesn't, you're grabbing the BVM, turning the O's all the way up, opening the airway and continuously stimulating the patient. By this point, the stats are back up and the patient is breathing again on their own. If it's still not working, you're still bagging the patient and stimulating the patient. If the SATs are holding while you're doing this, the provider may decide to wait to allow the meds to wear off and the patient to start breathing on their own again. But if it's not working and the patient is becoming more and more, un more unstable, reversal agents and intubation are considered. All right, now let's get into the must during the actual procedure. So keep it simple. We prepared and know that the most important thing is to keep the patient safe by continuously monitoring their cardiorespiratory drive. Ensure that they are taking good deep breaths as shown by chest rise and fall, keeping an eye on the SpO2 and that if it starts to drop, you can act. And also keeping an eye on the end title so if it starts to increase, you can also act. You're doing vitals every five minutes, keeping an eye on the blood pressure, and equally important, communicating with the team. For example, if the SpO2 starts to drop from 100 to 95 to 90, even if they are mid-procedure, you have to be you have to be vocal because airway and respiratory issues trump anything else. And it's important you speak up because everyone else may be focused on the procedure and not keeping an eye on the patient's vitals and cardiorespiratory status. But that's why you are there. You're there to keep the patient safe. So again, be vocal if you notice anything that is out of line. Now, let's get into some of the common medications used. These are going to include propofol, ketamine, versed, and fentanyl, and etomidate. Let's first start off with propofol. The typical dosing is 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram as the initial dose, then redosing with 0.25 milligrams to 0.5 milligrams per kg as needed. Although I've seen different providers use different regimens when, where some have gave the initial dose in half, letting it take effect, then seeing how the patient does, and then giving more little by little as needed. So just be aware that there's different ways of doing things. But the most important thing to remember is that being too safe is never bad, especially with these strong medications, because once you give them, you can't take them back out. So propofol is used because it's quick on and quick off. Onset is within one minute with a duration of 15 minutes, meaning the patient will come out from being sedated relatively quickly, which is something you want to do if the procedure did not take long. Remember to check with your state's board of nursing, but generally the proce for procedural sedation, the provider is the only one that can push it. So again, check with your own nursing board of, um, in your state. Main complications to watch out for include hypotension and respiratory depression. But again, that is why we prepare. We have all the necessary equipment readily available. We have the patient connected to the monitor with SpO2 and end title. We perhaps also have a liter of fluids ongoing. And perhaps the most important, you as the nurse are watching the patient in closely and monitoring as we discuss. Next is ketamine. Typical dosing is 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram as an initial dose, then 2.5 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram as needed. The key thing with ketamine is that the patients the patient maintains their airway reflexes. Although this is true, if it's pushed too fast, the patient's respiratory status and airway can also become compromised, which again, that is why you are carefully monitoring the patient. So never get complacent even with ketamine. People will say, oh, the patient keeps their, their airway reflexes intact. But again, you never just want to trust and you want to continually monitor your patients. Another key trait is that if the 
that ketamine also has analgesic properties, which will help the patient with any pain they can have. Again, also check with your state's board of nursing, but generally the, for procedural sedation, ketamine is bushed by the provider. Complications include emergent reactions, nausea, vomiting, laryngeal spasms, and rarely tachycardia and hypotension. Emergence reaction is, is a term used for when patients wake up and are disoriented, hallucinating, and perhaps a little combative. Typically, if it gets bad enough, the patient gets a dose of Reset to help them calm down. With nausea vomiting, as we discussed, we have suction readily available and other equipment, and if needed, anti-nausea medications like Zofran can be given. Again, the thing is to give any medication nice and slow because a lot of these drugs issues occur when they get slammed into the patient. Then there's Versed and Fentanyl. Typical dosing is 1 to 2 milligrams titrated to patient response and most importantly, given very slowly. Onset is within 5 minutes and duration up to 60 minutes. A key thing is when you first give the first dose, give it time to work before you start giving more and more. Because what will happen is that if you give more and more, it'll hit the patient all at once and yes, they're, they're going to go apneic. Complications include respiratory depression, apnea, and hypotension. With fentanyl, the typical dosing is 0.5 to 1 micrograms per kilogram. Onset is within 2 minutes during, with a duration of up to 60 minutes. C complications also include respiratory depression. Again, as always, the meds should be given nice and slow, allowing them time to take effect before more and more medications are given. The typical dosing for etomidate is 0.1 to 0.15 milligrams per kilogram as the initial dose. Onset is within 30 seconds and duration of up to 20 minutes. It, it does not have analgesic effects. However, it is very hemodynamically stable, meaning it won't affect the blood pressure as much compared to the other agents. Complications include myoclonus and respiratory depression. Like always, that is why we have all the necessary supplies and equipment ready, and most importantly, why you as the nurse are monitoring the patient closely throughout the procedure. Now, let's get a little bit into the post-procedure. You are continuously monitoring the patient for any complications until they are back to their baseline, meaning they are awake, answering all questions appropriately, they can maintain their own airway open, and are breathing without issues. Their SpO2 and BP are the same as prior to the procedure. Those are the most important, although, although some facilities can also include other things like the patient must be back to their baseline heart rate and pain label, level. You're typically taking vitals every 15 minutes. However, again, you're still one-to-one -one monitoring the patient until they're back to normal. Now let's get into some of the nursing tips. Key things include... Key things if your patient is going to be discharged is to ensure they are back to their baseline, as we said, especially their mentation and cardiorespiratory baseline. Also, ensure they aren't having any other symptoms like nausea. Also, very important, they need to have someone that will be accompanying them for at least the next several hours while they're at home. Again, you are there to keep the patient safe. So the best way to do this is to prepare and keep a close eye on them throughout the procedure, ensuring they are taking good breaths, meaning they are ventilating and oxygenating appropriately and keeping an eye on their vitals as well. And with the meds, remember that the safest is for them to be given slowly and if possible at lower doses and titrating or giving more based on the patient's response because once they are giving, they cannot be taken back. I know that was a long video. Thank you for sticking through the end. I ho really hope you learned something. At least I hope you are better able to keep your patients safe. Now let's get into the question of the day. When giving a thrombolytic agent like TPA or TNK for an ischemic stroke, lasting normal needs to be within how many hours? Again, when giving a thrombolytic agent like TPA or TNK for an ischemic stroke, lasting normal needs to be within how many hours? Thank you for your time today. I hope that I was at least able to teach you one thing. If you want to keep learning, I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description with my favorite being Sheehy's and the case files. As well, please take the time to watch my other videos. Also, if you would like to help support the channel, I have nursing stickers and shirts on Redbubble that you can check out again. Thank you for your time today. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.